sure there will be more time for the discussion. So can we have Richard Hidaria now to follow? Yes, thank you very much for that. Thank you again for this kind invitation. At first, I was wondering if this was correctly sent to me. I mean, uh, I'm not definitely an expert on Japanese domestic politics, although I did my PhD summer school in uh, back in Tokyo, in Waseda, back in the days. And of course, when DPJ until under Hatoyama was able to pull off that surprise victory back in the days, I was quite excited as far as Japanese politics is concerned. But I think over time, I was taught the lesson that Japan is more like a plus sajons, right? The more things change, the more things are the same, it seems. But even the, the same part has its own internal dynamics. And that's what I'll try to discuss a little bit. But of course, what I'm going to really focus on here is uh, how the region is going to look at the elections. And of course, the role that Japan is playing in 21st century security architecture uh, in the Asia Pacific region. I mean, first of all, I mean, speaking of Japan's domestic politics, just quickly some point on that, because I know our reactors actually know more than me on this. But let me just share some of my points on that. Uh, the precedence is not very good. Uh, if you remember after Junichiro Koizumi, for quite some time, there was a leadership vacuum in Japan, right? Uh, Abe, during his first attempt, didn't do very well, right? He barely lasted for a year in office. It was not until 2012 that he began to actually develop a much more kind of mature and stable kind of leadership. Of course, we remember the Hatoyama experience and the DPJ implosion, right? After a very strong initial start. So this is the worry that I think a lot of people have that after the longest streak of leadership by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, it will be very hard for his successors, at least in the immediate future, to get out of his shadow. Uh, Suga was not definitely very successful. So let's see what's going to happen uh, when it comes to um, uh, Kishida and other potential successors. Uh, I also know for a fact that Ta uh, former defense minister and foreign minister Taro Kono was seemingly the more exciting candidate, especially the initial rounds of internal votes within the LDP. My understanding is that Tarakan is also much more, Konosan is much more popular also with the more youthful wing and more youthful voters in Japan. And many thought that perhaps if Tarakan would have made it, he could have bet, made a better appeal to the broader population, especially in the upper uh, diet elections uh, next year. At the same time, of course, we see the opposition, the CDP and the communists and some progressive groups are kind of building some sort of a counter alliance. We know a divided opposition was always how the LDP was able to consolidate its position, almost regardless of its performance with some blips here and there. But generally, I think things are not looking too bad for Kishida. Yes, he started, I think, 13 points lower in terms of his approval rating in his, his cabinet than even Suga. I think Suga started at around 70 percent and we saw the implosion overall. But, you know, uh, electoral mobilization, uh, apathy levels, I think will definitely benefit LDP. I think the voter turnout based on some of the surveys was around 53%. I think that's a number I saw projected. So I think that's not really going to help the opposition because I think the last time the opposition did very well, the turnout was also very, very high. So when you have asymmetrical mobilization, it tends to benefit the LDP in this case. Uh, from what I also understand, I, I'm willing to be correct on this, uh, it seems that there is a kind of a buffer of up to 40 seats that maybe LDP can lose, but of course they want to keep the super majority as much as possible. So the, there's an uphill struggle, of course, for the CDP and opposition because there is some room for maneuver for the LDP. Although uh, CDP doesn't seem to be filing as so many candidates to be a viable opposition to really replace LDP. So this is really about chipping away at the dominance or whatever left of dominance of the LDP. Now, timing is also kind of on the side of Kishida. I think the COVID-19 vaccination rates have been really on an upswing. And I think we're expecting a certain degree of economic recovery, especially as supply chain, chain disruptions tend to stabilize hopefully by next year. So I think Kishida will be in a position to take some of the credit, especially for the COVID-19 vaccination rollout that of course I think Suga should be credited for, but now the, uh, Kishida will be reaping the benefits. Uh, as far as the foreign policy is concerned, I mean, we understand that Kishida's ability to pull off that surprise victory eventually was really the backing of Prime Minister Abe. And this is the point. It's very hard to get out of the shadow of the former Prime Minister when he has served so long and has been such a dominant figure domestically and internationally. And of, of course, we also see the Abe footprint in terms of the cabinet position, especially cabinet position that are relevant to foreign and defense policy. So that's, I think, something that is interesting. We're trying to watch from outside also are non-experts in the domestic politics of Japan, but are interested in the foreign policy of Japan. Now, on the second part, and I think this is where I really want to make my own kind of point, is that 
you know, if you look at Japan in many ways, it's what I can call a super middle power country in the region, right? I mean, it's still the third largest economy in the world. It still has the most advanced naval forces. Uh, it calls its armed forces self-defense forces, but I have I have experienced some of their major warships and they're pretty, pretty uh, impressive, right? And I think Japan uh, you know, definitely has the most advanced naval forces in Asia, although China, of course, is catching up very fast. But, you know, our American friends love to always talk about the so-called Tukidides trap, you know, what happens when there is a rapidly rising power meeting a declining status quo power. I think that Tukidides kind of situation was much more present in the case of East Asia, uh, especially as far as rivalry between Japan and China are concerned. I mean, just to give you some crazy numbers, back in 1990, Japan's economic output was 15% of the global GDP, and it was close to 70% of GDP of Asian region. At some point, I mean, Japan's defense spending was up to two times larger than uh, uh, than China's, right? Within my generation, right? Within the millennial generation. Today, the picture is absolutely different. It's China, which is increasingly dominating up to the majority of trade and regional uh, uh, GDP trends. J uh, Chinese defense spending nominally, I think, is three times larger than that of Japan. And actually, if you use the more accurate measures, which is purchasing power parity, China's defense spending could be as high as four to five hundred billion dollars based on some of the estimates by the economist intelligence unit which will put it far bigger than that of japan so i think there's been a lot of noise made about japan's increasing its defense spending and all of that but i think it's still far away from trying to catch up from china considering the strides that china has, has made nonetheless japan is important on four four import uh, on five important levels i mean first of all it is definitely middle power how do you define a middle power there have to be three elements for you to become a middle power or the three C's as they call it. Uh, first of all, you have to have a certain degree of capability to project power. Of course, we know the Japanese constitution doesn't allow it, at least so far, to offensively project power, but definitely Japanese uh, you know, maritime self-defense forces have the, uh, displayed their ability uh, to project power well beyond uh, Japan's immediate waters throughout time. And we see increasing interoperability improvement with key partners across the region. Of course, Japan also brings a lot of credibility in terms of its foreign defense policy in the region. If you look at the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies survey of most favored external powers, it's not the United States, it's not China, it's not even Europe that topped the, uh, the, the list. Consistently, Japan has been topping the list of most preferred external power for Southeast Asia in the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies ICS survey. Of course, this is not a public survey, this is a survey of opinion makers, pundits, policymakers. So very influential people in Southeast Asia continue to see Japan as their most favorite partner. And of course, since 2012, especially under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, we saw growing creativity in terms of Japan's navigating its constitutional limitations, but at the same time also playing a more proactive role in the region. Now, what's interesting is Kishida was also a foreign minister. We remember him very well for visiting the Philippines, I think on multiple occasions in ASEAN. So he's quite a familiar face. He's not some Nobody, right, who became the prime minister of Japan because of domestic political or party, mach uh, party machinations. But that brings me to the second level. What we're increasingly see as far as the U.S. policy in the region is concerned is what I can call a new Nixon doctrine or what, uh, uh, what the, the, uh, the Pentagon has called integrated deterrence. So if you look at the basic concept behind integra integrated deterrence is that there is a presupposition that while U.S. has to flex its muscle in this part of the region and reassert its leadership, its uh, efforts to deter further expansionist or worse instincts of China has to be integrated, meaning it has to be tied into a regional networks of partnerships and cooperation. And we clearly see how Japan is so important and central to the Pentagon's integrated deterrence strategy. Over the decades, we also saw revisions in the guidelines of the US-Japan Security Alliance. And I think we might see more of that in the future, especially as the nature of conventional and non-conventional threats in the region uh, morph. I think the fact that the Russians and the Chinese recently conducted uh, naval exercises and passed through what kind of see as almost Japan's internal waters, although these were international waters, I think that, that really sent a very worrying signal to the region. And I think the Americans will really push for growing security partnership with Japan in this part of the world as China begins to flex its muscle. Uh, on the third level, of course, uh, you know, one thing that Prime Minister Shinzo Abe perhaps should be credited for it is his stealthy and then increasingly, uh, I would say, um, um, you know, prominent role 
in terms of establishing the quad, I mean, if you look at the origins of the quad, in many ways, you could argue that it goes back to his very important speech before the Indian parliament in the mid 2000s, when he talked about the confluence of two seas. In fact, that was exactly the title of his speech, right? And that is where he would try to tie in and bring in India into a broader security architecture to kind of constrain China. And later on, of course, Shinzo Abe's term for that was a security diamond and the security diamond of democratic nation and like-minded countries in the region. And of course he wrote, uh, I, can, I think a project syndicate and a number of other columns on that very important concept. So Japan has been very central to the emergence of the Quad, which according to the Biden administration is the, increasingly the platform for coordinating security affairs in this part of the world. I think it would be too controversial and journalistic for us to say that Quad is an Asian NATO, right? Or a NATO with Asian characteristics, but clearly Quad is getting increasingly institutionalized under the Biden administration. I think there's a growing appreciation that the Quad is filling in the gap uh, of you know, deficiencies within the ASEAN or deficiency within the existing uh, hub and spokes security networks in terms of constraining China's worst instincts. So I see the Quad moving forward more and more, whether we have the AUKUS, ROKUS or whatsoever. I mean, I think Indians are increasingly also getting more involved in the Quad and they see also Quad as a way for them to also project their power internationally and underscore also their growing role internationally. But on the fourth level, what I think Japan is extremely important is the role of Japan in terms of infrastructure development and providing an alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, the numbers are just staggering. It's, it's, it's just amazing how everyone talks about China's BRI but the thing with the Chinese is that they get more bang out of imaginary buck, right? They have made so many pledges of billions of dollars, but a lot of that didn't come into fruition. What is good with Japan is that when they make pledges, a lot of that pledges actually come into fruition. And a lot of that pledges actually relies on domestic labor, if not sometimes technology transfer. None of that is the case with China. Just give, let me just give you some numbers. So of course, under Abe back in 2015, 16, there was a $110 billion infrastructure investment program but let me zero on, on, on Southeast Asia, because everyone talks about as if China is taking over Southeast Asia and, oh, my God, Chinese workers and technology is all over. That is not the picture at all. If you look at the new pledges, not stock investments, Japan is already leading in many countries in terms of stock investment. Total Japanese new pledges of infrastructure big ticket investment is $367 billion in Southeast Asia. This is a number of 2019. China is $255 billion. And interestingly, why China has an upper hand in places like Cambodia and Laos, unexpectedly, of, uh, expectedly, sorry, uh, in places like Vietnam and the Philippines, actually Japan has a factor of two or three times more investment than China. And a lot of these investments are actually operationalizing on like the imaginary investments uh, from, from China. In places like Indonesia, which is a very interesting place, there's kind of a head-to-head -head competition between Japan and China. And when China's projects do not go well, like the Bandung-Jakarta railway, guess what the Indonesian do? They ask the Japanese to come and help and bail them out on this. So Japan is absolutely still in this game. It may have been trounced by China over the past two decades in terms of its rankings in the global GDP, in terms of its defense spending, et cetera. But in Southeast Asia, Japan is an absolutely major player in terms of infrastructure development as it has been for almost a century in terms of industrializing the region. Not to mention, globally speaking, Japan has been playing also a very, very important role. We're talking about bilateral deals like the $4.5 billion dollar high-tech infrastructure in initiative with the Biden administration during Suga's visit to White House. We're talking about minilateral, trilateral initiatives like the Blue Dot Network together with Australia and the US. There was already a stakeholders meeting in Paris earlier this year where, when they, they brought Wall Street sovereign wealth funds. You know, there's $110 trillion of private funds just in the air there. And what you really need to do with the BDN and other initiatives like the Build Back Better World Initiative with the G7, where Japan will also play an important role, is to get more of these global investments directed towards the developing countries and provide a stable and robust alternative to that of China. Not to mention, of course, Japan played also a very important role in essentially rescuing the TPP after Trump dumped it and also finalizing the world's biggest bilateral free trade agreement with the European Union. 
this is a very impressive list that for some reason I don't think is much appreciated. So I think Japan should do a better job of promoting what it has been achieving. I think as Macron said, we're not good in promoting our own successes in the case of EU. I think the same thing also applies in Japan. And lastly, here in ASEAN in Southeast Asia, especially in the Philippines, Japan is a very, very important actor. If you look at all the frontline states who have been suffering at the hands of China's maritime expansionism, Japan is rapidly building up maritime security cooperation. We're talking about Vietnam. We're talking about even Indonesia, which was supposed to be a neutral country in South, South China Sea disputes. But because of the North Natuna disputes with the lower tip of the Nine Dash Line, the Indonesians are now also bulking up and the Japanese are getting into the picture. I remember during my interview with, foreign, uh, with Defense Secretary Lorenzano of the Philippines uh, two years ago before the pandemic that, you know, he was discussing us even purchasing some more advanced, uh, you know, hardware, military hardware from Japan, right? And there were even discussions of purchasing submarines from Japan potentially. And Japan has already provided surveillance materials, Coast Guard, multi-role vessels to the Philippines, to Vietnam, to Malaysia. So these are, I, I think, so on multiple fronts, Japan has been reasserting its position as absolutely a kind of a super middle power, right? And that is why what happens domestically in Japan if and what happens to Kushida and other successors after Abe, in one way or another, will definitely be a point of concern for all of us. Thank you very much. I'll keep it there. I, I hope I didn't go so much over time. But I think those key points should, have, should be emphasized as far as Japan's role in the uh, region is concerned. Thank you, Richard. So after listening to Professor Takenaka and Richard Heydarian, we have the more um, domestic um, realities. And then we have uh, the implications of Japan elections in the region, on the region. May we now have the reactors? Let's start with Professor Sol Takahashi. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity. Um, uh, and uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, I'm of course a professor, uh, my title is Professor of Human Rights and Peace Studies. I'm a human rights lawyer. So that's really uh, where I come from. Um, and uh, that will sort of form the basis of, of my, my, my views on all of these kind of things. Um, you know, getting back to sort of domestic Japanese politics, I mean, as already noted by the two speakers, you know, we've had a, a very long, in fact, the, the longest serving prime minister in uh, the post-war history, at least, uh, under Shinzo Abe from 2012 to 2020. Um, we had what, uh, and, I, and I don't think I'm being too controversial when I say we had really an, an extreme nationalist uh, a succession, a succession of succession of extreme nationalist governments and cabinet members, starting from the prime minister down throughout the cabinet, with close ties to very shadowy uh, extremist organizations in in the country. Um, there was this, you know, there's this virtual explosion of, of nationalist, even in many cases xenophobic, narratives and uh, throughout the media. Uh, and, um, you know, by high ranking politicians and, and, you know, throughout the country and really a string of legis string of, of bills that were rammed through parliament that had very, very serious human rights concerns, um, human rights concerns, which were picked up by international human rights bodies, like the high commissioner for human rights and, you know, other international bodies. And these are just, you know, shrugged off. So, you know, we had this sort of long span of a very, very nationalist, very right wing uh, government. And that also uh, has been pointed out as is, is reflected also in the foreign policy issues as well. I mean, the increased reliance on the military as a as a potential tool of foreign policy, the whole quad uh, thing, as has already been pointed out, that was really Abe's initiative. And uh, so this was, you know, this was sort of how it was. And it still remains the case that, you know, Abe is an extremely, as has been pointed out, extremely influential, influential figure in the LDP. I mean, he's not prime minister anymore, of course, but he's in the shadow, he's lurking in the shadows as a, as a kingmaker. And the, the really extreme narratives that had been promoted under his, under his cabinets and during his, his, um, premiership have really become you know the mainstay um, even also mainstreamed throughout much of the mainstream uh, Japanese media I would say certainly including the treatment of China as an all-around boogeyman 
uh, and just a general sort of threat, threat of what? We're not really sure, but somehow the Chinese are a threat to everything. They're an economic threat. They're a threat to our security. They're a threat to these islands, which we claim. They're a threat to our way of life. We don't know, but somehow they're a threat. And this kind of idea has really become, I, I would even, you know, there's very little way to measure this, but it's been really been become mainstream throughout uh, the popular discourse. So, you know, we had that, um, he had to, uh, he had to leave his position for various different reasons. And we had, of course, Suga, who really couldn't pick, really couldn't run with the ball. I mean, he was overtaken by events, the whole Corona thing really wasn't dealt with well. And so now we have uh, a new guy, the new guy on the block, Prime Minister Kishida. Um, I think actually, Kishida has got a little bit of a bum rap in the international media. I, I, I mean, everything I've read about him presents him as a very uninspiring figure. And I think a lot of foreign commentators seem to think that he's, you know, he's not going to last that long. Um, and that was also the case with some Japanese commentators, at least at the beginning, I would say. But I'm not so sure. I, I, I'm a little bit less pessimistic about him. I mean, first of all, looking at the candidate, it could have been far worse, first of all. But it was, um, you know, he is, he has a, a certain amount of an independent mindset. And while it is true that in the internal party elections for uh, the, the head of the party, the premiership, um, in the end, he did, uh, so to speak, get in bed with, with Abe and his sort of extreme right faction. But, uh, you know, looking at at least some of his um, cabinet appointments, and, you know, given Kishida's history, you know, just can't really judge him on what he's done since he's become prime minister in such a short span of time. And of course, he, the first thing he did was call elections. So nothing's really happening now. But, um, you know, looking at his past, you know, judging him from his past actions and just the kind of person that I believe him to be, uh, he's got his independent mind. And I, and I think some of the messages he's sending uh, certainly are a little bit more to my liking, at least, and certainly um, less bullish nationalist and less sort of aggressive nationalists, if you like, than had been the case previously. Um, the sort of elephant in the room in Japanese politics, at least for a while, had always been the changing the constitution to, um, to in various different ways. The LDP had, has this big, thick uh, draft constitution that it wants, to, it wants to see to be our next constitution. And certainly from the human rights point of view, it has just huge, huge amounts of problems, which I can't get into today because we don't have the time. Um, and uh, Abe was very much trying to push that and some of, you know, some other things with the, with the change of the constitution. Suga said he was going to continue on with that, but of course, again, he didn't have, it just didn't happen. And uh, Kishida has sort of made a few, uh, made, made a few uh, statements about that. He sort of suggested that he will, he will also sort of push for that, but I don't think his heart is into it. So, uh, you know, he, he's a little bit more independent minded than I think many people give him credit for. And I think he might last a little bit longer and come out with a little bit more of a, um, a softer version, <laughs> if you like, of what the LDP has been promoting up till now. I personally would certainly think, uh, look at that as a good thing. Um, I think uh, um, I think the uh, you know certainly it, throughout this the, the internal party election from for premiership again you know the whole thing of, of uh, the whole treatment of China was a really big issue uh, you know far more than frankly I think it ever has been and uh, once again you know we see this kind of China as the boogeyman being repeated over and over and over not just in the sort of right leaning media but you know, certainly in the mainstream media as well. And that's a, that's a worrying trend that I think will not um, go away that easily, despite she does sort of a little bit more softer, softer messages on that, on that front. So that's, that's something that I, I certainly am very concerned about. I think, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not so sure that a lot of what is being done under the quad is, is, is so positive in the region. I think there's a lot of saber rattling. I think there's unnecessary saber rattling, unnecessary, um, what I might even call warmongering that's going on. And uh, it's not just from the quad side, of course, I'm not saying that, you know, everything that the Chinese are doing is, is perfectly above board, but I'm not sure escalating it is really the right uh, approach. So, um, 
that's, you know, that's one concern I have with all of this, and one concern I have with all of these kind of narratives. I think, again, Kishida has a little bit more of a reasonable outlook or a reasonable mindset on those kind of issues than Abe certainly had and probably Suga and many of the others. Whether he'll be able to carve out this, in my mind, the real issue is whether Kishida will be able to carve out the space for the things that he is, for his policies and what he really wants to do. Um, and when, you know, whether he will be able to sort of fend off the wolves from, from the right wing camp of the LDP and you know, be able to walk down his own independent path. And for that, we just have to see, we have to see what's gonna happen. I agree certainly with the two commentators. I mean, nobody expects the LDP to lose a majority. They might lose some seats. I mean, that's probably gonna happen, but no, nobody expects the real game to change. And that is, um, uh, I mean, unfortunate in a way, because I, as, as I think many people have pointed out over the decades, you know, this sort of one party control over Japanese politics that has continued pretty much without interruption uh, since 1955. You know, it's, it's not healthy. I don't think it's healthy for Japanese politics. I don't think it's healthy for the country in general. Um, you know, and, and there are a number of different, you know, many, many a tree has been felled on, on why this is the case and why people are so apathetic and why people don't want to vote and, you know, all this kind of thing. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is, I think many people, many people don't vote, think, well, there's no point in voting because nothing's going to change. Other people don't vote because, you know, they're pretty happy with what's how things are. So, you know, it, it very much depends. And I think, you know, much more research needs to be done. But um, what is clear is that you know one of the reasons that the LDP is so strong is precisely because they have been in power for so long. They've managed to uh, you know create networks of entrenched interests. And in all fairness to them, they have, you know, they've got um, a very strong um, uh, party uh, structure, a party, a party structure, which most of the other, most of the opposition parties lack. Um, you know, they have offices and sort of you know, youth organizations all over the place. And the opposition party just haven't been able, they, they haven't had the wherewithal to sort of get this kind of thing done. So, you know, power power le le has led to more power. Power has, has enabled them to sort of maintain the power. And that's, of course, how these kind of things work. They've been very good at doing this. I mean, they've been very skilled at doing this. But I, I really would hope that, you know, the opposition, I'm, I'm looking at some of the opposite parties, at least, to really sort of get their act together and cooperate and also sort of create the kind of party apparatus that, uh, you know, the LDP and also the Komeito, the clean, uh, the, the Buddhist party have to, uh, to be able to fight on a bit more of equal terms with the LDP. But I fear that's not going to happen by Halloween. So, you know, well, that's, that's something that we'll, we'll just have to hope for in the future. So I hope those thoughts are, are, are helpful. And I, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Saul Takahashi. Now we have a more nuanced view of Kishida. You're right, we've been following yes. the coverage. <laughs> and he seems so uninspiring and, and dull. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, the dull may not be such a bad thing considering what some of the exciting guys are like. Okay, um, but, the yeah. Q well, you won't join us for the Q&A, but anyway, Thank you. Unfortunately, so yes. Thank so, you very much. May I now call on the next reactor, Robin Ramcharan? Thank you, Marites. Uh, and thanks to everyone. Thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting Asia Center and myself to be part of this uh, uh, interesting and, ver and very useful and uh, important discussion. Um, knowing about what comes, who is this next prime minister and what are the policies of Japan? Uh, domestically and in the region. I think I'm joining Saul very much here uh, in his general line of questioning. Um, I, I, I come to this for, as someone who has done his doctoral work on ASEAN-Japan relations. Uh, I come to it also uh, as someone who uh, is at the Asia Center and also working on rights and democracy uh, in the region, uh, in Southeast Asia. So um, ha having said that, let me maybe try to focus in on um, the meaning of the election uh, as we've all been trying to do. And maybe also I would like to come to the man himself. Uh, 
And please take my comments as questions rather than statements. <laughs> so uh, there are more uh, questions for the audience and for, especially for the panelists uh, to respond to. So uh, of course, the first thing here is as Saul and others were saying, uh, there's no question that the LDP will win again and they will win again and again and again until fundamental changes happen happen, which leads me to ask the question, you know, uh, or, or to raise the question about the dominance of conservative nationalist elites in Japanese politics since the late 19th century. This is this didn't just happen after 55. Despite the reforms of the Americans between 45 and 50, whatever it was, 51, um, the same elite, the same leadership remained, the same what you call public-private partnership uh, is still there, the same zaibatsus. Maybe not the same, but the, the fundamental relationships, uh, you know, kind of relationships are still there. So uh, is politics essentially driven by this conservative nationalist elite? Uh, I think we often forget the role, uh, I, I know Saul has talked about it, but the role of elites in national politics uh, everywhere. The second thing, and, and sorry, uh, in those elites, you know, to the extent that there are changes, I recall the late 19th century party politics of Japan was dominated by particular personalities, and the same way post 40, 55. And so to the extent that there have been changes, it really depended on the person, uh, usually the men, right? No or very few women so far. So it usually depended on the men. And so that leads to my second point, and, and Saul touched upon this. Uh, no, we, we would like to know what are the nuances of the man? I, I understand you know, the, the criticisms or the portrayal of him that Saul talked about. At the same time, in my own re readings, he seems like a steady hand. He seems like a more technocratic figure who is competent and he is known domestically, but he's also known internationally. So that puts him in a very good uh, position uh, uh, overall, um, you know, as a stable figure uh, domestically and, and internationally. Uh, the third thing, uh, which uh, Senator Pangilinan, uh, I hope they got the name right, sorry, um, raised, which is the nature of politics. And if you look at decision making ultimately in the diet, you know, um, in the cabinet and the diet, legislation that is put forward in the diet is basically agreed to before getting to any kind of debate. Real, there's, is there real debate in the parliament, right? Things seem, seem to have been decided between this public-private partnership uh, well before, and it's almost a rubber stamp in, in the diet. So, so I'm, that leads me to, to one thing, which is, uh, you know, speaking of change and the low turnout um, of the voters, what is the youth? What is the what do the youth have to say about all of this? Are their voices represented? Represented, and are they? Uh, what, how do they see uh, Kishida? Is he part of the old god, or do they see these nuances uh, that that's all uh, you know mentioned? In terms of the policies, the fourth thing, fourth broad area, I would like to mention. I see um, there are maybe four areas where you know focusing in on the men if the men is supposed can make a difference so hopefully he can make a difference in terms of domestic policy on the COVID front and uh, professor takenaka spoke about those those policies uh, thank you for that uh, very interesting um, so he's promised to cr cr create this command center uh, uh, approach fine uh, to pursue his more forceful and effective policies. Let's hope that is the case. If I can put a foreign policy twist on that coming to Richard's uh, general thrust, you know, how, if at all, how is Japan countering, how is he proposing the men to counter China's vaccine diplomacy? Is, is Japan offering vaccines to, for example, the ASEAN region? What is its um, position on that and what is his position uh, likely to be on that. Uh, we can't ignore the fact that vaccine diplomacy of China, if, if the Quad uh, is forming uh, with a focus on China, then this has to be part of that diplomacy, uh, one would think. 
Uh, the second thing is, okay, uh, Richard mentioned, uh, and Professor Takenaka, sorry, mentioned this new capitalism. And part of that is this redistribution effort, and maybe a center left uh, kind of approach. And so the, the point of protection of, of um, technologies and so on was mentioned. I believe that was mentioned. So is the shift to the left in foreign policy terms, economic statecraft, does that signal a Kishida approach which will be more quote unquote protectionist, right? Uh, let's, the, one of the very baby elephants in the room is the intellectual property disputes between China and the West. So, so will that be part of it, uh, this new capitalism and this new protection of these vital technologies, for example? Uh, thirdly, the third thing is, okay, we've talked enough about uh, China, the foreign policy towards China. Um, there are these recurring issues of the Yasukuni shrine and so on. I view those as part of the diplo diplo diplomatic rhetoric and um, the posturing. Um, but at the same time, to, to, to Saul's point, you know, um, will Kishida be able to tone down the rhetoric? Uh, and I, I join Saul there uh, very much. Can we tone down this rhetoric? After all, whether it's, um, for example, the, the Senkaku Jiaoyu dispute, dispute, I mean, what's the real um, importance of that other than rhetorical? Uh, there's no real, you know, it's nationalists on both sides uh, using it for domestic reasons. But, but you know, the, the danger is that combined with other disputes is that it spills over uh, into a, a more forceful dispute, uh, for example. So is this the, uh, the, you know, Kishida also went to the shrine with all the other uh, members, uh, contestants for the leadership, and they all, uh, you know, embraced uh, this uh, visit. He was more... Uh, definitive compared to, uh, I forget his name, I think, was it Kono, uh, uh, who says, okay, I will go there on an individual basis, but Kishida is saying, appealing to the nationalists uh, on this front with, with a more resolute uh, statement uh, uh, and so on. I forget the exact term. Um, and the last point maybe is about, and I joined Saul here very much, but on the foreign policy front, the, the issue of values. Yeah, and that issue of values can be expressed both in human rights terms. I mean, what's Kishida's perspective on fundamental human rights values? Promotion in the international arena. Um, and he has said, he has been quoted as saying, quote unquote, uh, the PRC is exporting its authoritarian um, model, quote unquote. So does that mean he will take a forceful or more resolute line on the human rights front in the context of the Quad? After all, that is one of the key points of the dispute between the Quad and, um, and China, is it not, after all? And this will be a, an important dimension for the 21st century going forward. So, so um, the values dimension of the Quad, um, the United States, um, is more, less nuanced uh, in its approach to China. You are authoritarian, um, we are democratic, we have to counter you, not only for security reasons, so it's clear. Japan's approach to the Quad is much more nuanced. Okay, we don't really want to upset China, uh, but we still have to do something without saying, you know, uh, as much. So, so I take Richard's point about, you know, the, the, the middle power kind of approach, but the question is, um, you know, do, don't, do we have to, don't we have to make our positions clearer, uh, especially given your, um, depends, um, alignment, the centrality of the security relationship with the United States. Can Kishida avoid this dimension? Number And the last thing I would mention is, uh, just occurred to me as Richard was speaking, you have this whole quad set up and you have the new AUKUS and you know other awkward names that may emerge. Uh, terrible joke. So what happens to the 
ARF centrality, ASEAN centrality. It seems like the ARF is now just being sidelined, right? What's the utility? And, and again, coming back to the man, what is his position on the ARF? Uh, my feeling and my own assessment from my research, in a, and there is a forthcoming uh, you know, publication on this, is that Japan has changed roots from a time when it believed in the ARF and people like um, uh, Hisashi Owada, who was the architect of the, uh, you know, the, the move towards a better, the Fukuda doctrine, and was one of the architects of designing this uh, ARF model and so on. Well, it seems Japan has gone away from that, um, has kind of lost faith and has gone towards a more uh, realist view that feeds into the whole nationalist rhetoric. So I'm wondering what Mr. Kishida's uh, approaches will be. Uh, so I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Maritas. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Robin. In fact, uh, I'm glad that you raised a number of questions. So this will be <laughs> the start of the Q&A. Uh, let me just set some um, guidelines. Excuse me, sorry. I'm afraid I really must uh, must go now. Like yes. I like I mentioned, I have a, yes, I have an obligation yeah. that I really can't get out of. But we're going to miss you in the open forum. But okay. please, uh, we can always email you in the future. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you, thank you very much for this opportunity, and it was it was very fulfilling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So some, to our viewers, just some reminders. You may ask your questions for those in the Zoom. You may ask your questions live by clicking the raise hand button, or you can type your question in the Q&A box. And also for those watching on Facebook, please write your questions on the comment section, and this will be sent uh, by a moderator to the Q&A box. So now, Professor Takenaka, I think you have to, can you please respond to some of the key issues that Robin raised I can uh, remind you that uh, he asked about uh, the man, Kishida, mm -hmm. will he be able to tone down the nationalist rhetoric on Senkaku uh, and, and the like? And number two, an interesting question about uh, the role of Japan in, in vaccine diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the explicit policy? But just to say that the Philippines has been receiving donations of vaccines from Japan. And number three, I think also uh, because the Quad has been mentioned here a number of times, can you speak about the Quad and Japan's role and perception and also Japan-China policy? So that's a lot maybe to begin with and then we can ask Richard to jump in later. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me, I feel a bit uneasy about being uh, the dominance of conservative nationalists. I mean, it's just we are being realistic, okay? Just make it clear. And uh, I don't, and um, although uh, Prime Minister Abe has been, I mean, has, uh, I think he has a nationalist orientations, but as a prime minister, he has been, uh, he has, tr he has tried to be more modest and realistic and uh, also i mean you can see various uh, ministerial appointments he has a point and also to the uh, ldp executives under the second Abe administrations he has appointed a number of liberal oriented uh, politicians including uh kishida uh, fumio kishida as a foreign minister uh he's a uh, he's a uh, from a faction which has a tradition of pacifist so um, Prime Minister Abe uh, is has been a very uh, realistic politician. Okay, so then, and also as as to the rhetoric, I don't think Kishida, uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida, will um, increase unnecessary tensions with our neighbors by uh, using uh, unnecessary nationalist rhetorics. And this relates to the fourth point, which raised, which is raised by uh, Professor Ramcharan on our uh, human rights policy vis-a-vis -vis our neighbors. Okay, one uh, one di one Indian diplomat, which I respect very much, has made me a good suggestion. 
you don't really have to name a country. You can always emphasize uh, universalistic principles uh, to uh, emphasize, to make your points clear. So I think we are going to adopt that kind of approach. We are going to emphasize universal values such as uh, freedom, human rights, uh, democracy, and so forth. But I don't think we are going to make unnecessary tensions with our neighbors uh, by pointing out uh, some names clearly. Okay. And our neighbors are aware of our kind of a nuanced approach. And uh, we are going to deal with uh in such uh, with our neighbors in such a way and as for the vaccines we have already provided vaccines to taiwan vietnam philippines and i think we are going to continue that approach and especially because we have uh, a lot of uh, uh some um surplus in the vaccines which we have secured so i think we are happy to provide them and I don't think we are going to make it kind of uh, put attach strategic nuance to it because I don't think that's uh, that's uh, that's not productive. You know, if you, you know, we just do it for humanitarian purposes, not for strategic strategic reasons. And um, as for the quad. Yes, we are going to promote quad with. Uh, President Biden, and uh, we have strong we have strong ties, of course, with the United States. But we are going to strengthen our ties with Australia, and uh, I think we are going to have a new agreement with Australia, which will make it much easier for Australian uh, services to station and visit Japan, and vice versa. And for India, yes, we are going to, I mean, we have been expanding our cooperation with, me, with, with India. And this is most, I mean, and the military cooperation uh, or security relations uh, cooperation uh, among the four countries have been uh, mostly, uh, it's, it's most visible in the fact that the joint naval exercises uh, among the four countries have began uh from last year and we have just conducted uh i mean malabar uh, we have just conducted the second uh, malabar joint exercises uh i mean we had two 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 series of exercises uh from this september but we have just conducted the second one and uh, with uh us aircraft carrier and our helicopter sort of quasi aircraft carrier so I think we are going to, and for the, 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 the important element of Quad is really to protect the sea lanes for these countries. So I think we are going to build up more uh, cooperation among the navies and our maritime self-defense force. And that's how we are going to do it. And as for the, uh, let me just adjust the point about the protectionist orientation. It's not really a protectionist orientation. It's, I mean, we support free trade and we have pursued the policy by, uh, with, uh, as, as uh, Richard has mentioned, we have uh, conducted, we have led the TPP negotiations and then the TPP 11 negotiations, uh, Japan EU free trade agreement. So what we are trying to do is protect outflows of our technologies to uh, some um, some of our neighbors which might use it for some uh, purposes other than economy i mean for military purposes and many japanese have are very much concerned that our the level of our technology or research compared with other countries have been going down and so we are going to increase much more uh, budget, increase our budget spending on our development of a new technologies and new, 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 I mean, new technologies and um, uh, yes, new, new devices. And that's, that's to 
to promote economic security and uh, to promote, uh, I think, the kind of self-sufficiency of uh, economy. I mean, look at what's been happening about the situation of uh, automobile production because of shortage of semiconductors, right? That really undermines not Japanese economy, but uh, economy of other countries. And we don't want that kind of situation continue to happen. So that's what we are going to do. And I think I have answered pretty much. I mean, the Kishida, I think he's a pacifist. He's very gentle. He's a very nice person. So I think, uh, I think, I mean, he tried to cultivate, you know, friendly relationship with other countries, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Takenaka. Richard, before you uh, respond, can I just read this question, which both of you can answer later, just to put it on the table? This is an anonymous attendee, and he wants both Professor Takenaka and Richard to respond. There is the they share the concern of the Taiwan people with possible arm takeover by Beijing. So hoping that there will be some sort of peaceful solution. So the question is, what do you think should be such peaceful solution that you could suggest realistically? Because the, the questioner is also worried by the Quad and other attempts by the US and its allies to form closer ties with Taiwan, which would certainly antagonize Beijing. So I'll park that here and maybe Richard, you want to respond first to the earlier points, and then we can ask Professor Takenaka and Richard again to respond to the last question. Right, I'll just try to be as quick as possible. And usually I try to avoid talking about anything that has to do with Abe when I'm among <laughs> uh, Japanese academics and friends, because a lot of them are liberals. And I mean, just saying anything positive about the Abe administration tends to uh, get a certain response. But I mean, first of all, let me just say that Abe hasn't been so Abe over the past six, seven years of, of, of you know, of his rule. I mean, I think this is where I really agree with uh, Professor Takenaka. I mean, uh, on the Yasukuni Shrine issue, you know, he kind of tried to correct some of the excesses earlier on. We saw even on the uh, on the Diaoyu, uh, sorry, Senkaku uh, Diaoyu disputes, uh, we didn't see any major conflagration with China as we saw back in 2012, for instance. I, I think the DPJ folks didn't do a very good job on that front compared to what Abe has been doing on the on the issue of China. Also, we have seen constructive, literally alternative. Uh, you know, I, I talk about free trade. I talk about infrastructure investments on vaccine diplomacy. You know, when the million uh, AstraZeneca vaccine came to the Philippines a few months ago, President Duterte personally went there and thanked Japan. Right. So, I mean, if you look at the Japanese on multiple fronts, Prime Minister Abe was nowhere as the kind of warmonger, right wing, crazy nationalist guy as some of our friends are, are you know, have been, have been trying to imply. And, you know, in many ways, I think, yes, of course, we don't want the kind of some of the aggressive nationalist language coming out of US, Japan, or any of these other countries. But there is a dialectical process here. It's not like China is just an innocent bystander there and we are just like ganging up on China. I think this is something that is usually missed. I think people are saying, okay, China is China. Let's just accept that. And then we keep on criticizing ourselves. So I think there's an excess of self-criticism as far as us in, in, in the other side of some of the disputes is concerned. Nonetheless, on the issue of human rights, I mean, I really like the, uh, the, the fact that Robin raises. My problem is that if you raise that point, um, I mean, what about India, right? I mean, I, I'm not sure Narendra Modi has been necessarily a bastion of liberal democratic values, right? We can talk about this forever. And I think some of our friends, even the US have been emphasizing that, that maybe Biden has to tone down a little bit on this gung-ho human rights thing, because that could backfire on us, right? Especially when some of our members have very questionable human rights standards. I mean, I think, you know, everyone talks about Duterte and Bolsonaro, you know, but I think what Narendra Modi has been doing over the past few years has to put him in a similar category of right-wing authoritarian leaders. So I think that has to be there. And then the issue of ASEAN centrality, again, of course, everyone is giving ASEAN a chance, but this is my problem with ASEAN. ASEAN has to also get its act together. I mean, look at it. On AUKUS, everyone is lining up to bash AUKUS, right? <laughs> Even though Australia is a non-nuclear country. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen with the submarines down the road. Is it going to be as aggressively deployed? And then what? And then the Chinese do a hypersonic missile test. The Chinese deploy nuclear submarines. Everything in the region, you hear nothing from Malaysia. You hear nothing from Indonesia. I think absolute hypocrisy on the part of a lot of ASEAN countries on these issues. And in the part of the Philippines, absolute mess. The foreign secretary is for AUKUS. The defense secretary is neutral. The president is against it. So, I mean, 
if you are the United States and you have concerns with, with China, if you are Japan, you have concerns with China, you cannot wait forever for ASEAN to get its act together. I think ASEAN has to do its part of the job. And ARF is not useless. I think ARF still has a value. I remember very well when Kono San was here in Manila during the ASEAN summit, the North Korean foreign minister was here. So ARF, I think, still provides the kind of institutionalized dialogue that complements some of the deficiencies right, or fills in for some of the deficiencies in terms of lack of six-party talks, bilateral talks, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not saying ARF is useless, but I'm saying that to keep on saying that, oh, what about ASEAN centrality? Oh, what about ASEAN willingness to make sure that it's really central in this region? So I think sometimes we're being too babysitting the ASEAN, oh, their feelings will be hurt, but you, get, you have to get your act together. I know my, my opinion or something minority in the ASEAN, but I, I definitely understand that I think these discussions are happening behind the scenes. Even some of our Indonesian friends, Rizal Sukma, Ivan Laksamana, just check your tw their Twitters. They're also very disappointed with what's happening in the ASEAN. And lastly, on this issue of Taiwan, of course, Taiwan is close to my heart. I was based there in 2019, talked to all the, essentially all the senior leaders, presidents, et cetera, on this issue. I mean, this is where I think Japan will be extremely, extremely important, right? The Taiwan issue. We're seeing some very interesting statements coming from the, the new cabinet now of, of, of Kishida, the defense ministry and all. I think the Abel line is more or less there. Now, I think, as I said, this is not about containment strategy. We cannot contain China. China is just too big and important to be contained. This is not Soviet Union. We cannot pull that off. The best we can do is to constrain China through calibrated countermeasures. And I think the same thing applies to Taiwan. It has to be made clear to China that should there be kinetic action against Taiwan or a significant cyber attack to shut down their very strategic cheap production factories or et cetera, there will be costs for China, not necessarily military intervention, but diplomatic economic countermeasures. And I think that's, that's something that is very important to be made clear. Again, this is not to provoke war with China. That's ridiculous. The Chinese don't want war too. But if you, don't have, but if you lose the test of wheels, you are encouraging the more hawkish voices in China to elevate their position. But if you hold the line, I mean, this is my understanding with China, as in many communist regimes, they have contempt for weakness. I can say that in the case of our president, mm -hmm. <laughs> for that matter. But they respect resolve, not warmongering, but resolve. And I'm, this is where I really love the panel's discussion on the man and the moment, especially on Kishida. I think Kishida, for now, is a little bit dependent on Abe. He kind of rolled back some of his progressive policy proposals. I've been following that. But hopefully, if he does well, in the uh, next elections next year for the upper house, he kind of gains ground and confidence. We may see actually him, uh, the Kishida progressive, actually more reasserting himself. Unfortunately for now, he has to kind of play with the, with the Abe uh, wing, but I think things could change. And Kishida might be just the right guy to go to China, right? I mean, he might be the Nixon, but not so Nixon guy to make the deal with China down the road because he's much more calibrated. He doesn't have the baggage of Abe. Talking about Kishida is less toxic than talking about Abe, especially among liberal academic friends, right? So, so I think that's as I'm more excited to talk about Kishida foreign policy, hopefully for some time to come. I'll just keep it there. Thank you very much. Hi, hi, Professor Takenaka. Maybe you can respond to the question on Taiwan, which uh, Richard addressed earlier. Yeah, just let me let me put that uh, about make one point about Abe. But we should we should give him credit that Sino Japan relationship in, in fact improved under the second Abe administrations. And we have made it clear that we are happy to uh, cooperate with their BRI project if uh, they are respect for conditions which we have set. So we have been very carefully managing. I mean the Prime Minister Abe succeeded in um, very carefully managing. Uh, to improve, you know, Japan relationship. That's uh, that's so. I think that, and also there are so many options for prime minister. Uh, I mean, regardless of uh, regardless of who becomes Japanese prime ministers, we have to respond to this rise of China. Uh, we have to uh, protect sea lanes. Uh, we have to sustain uh, corporations to counter um, with other, uh, other liberal countries to uh, counterbalance uh, the rise of China. So I think that Prime Minister Kishida will continue that path regardless of 
whether he's under the influence of Prime Minister Abe or whether he's a dub or not. So we don't have so many options. And uh, about as regards to Taiwan, I completely agree with what Richard has said about uh, the importance of showing, demonstrating our resolve against uh, China or maybe the former Soviet Union that uh, we are committed uh, and we don't we do not want to see uh, some um, boldish experiment by China against Taiwan. We have made this we have been making this point more and more clear since under the um, from the time I think from the time of Suga administration that we are going to uh, I mean the Taiwan is a subject of our US uh, Japan uh, security uh, treaty. And uh, and also uh, we, that that's where our uh, the security legislations of 2015 comes into play. That every many Japanese think that the United States is the only the subject of the country which we are going to exercise uh, the right of collective defense. But if you read the laws very carefully. Uh, we can um, resort to the exercise of the right of collective defense if our government judges the country is in close relationship with Japan and the threat to this country a really a, a endangers the Japanese security and the survival of Japanese students. Then Chinese are aware of this. So we have to make clear that, I mean, so I think it's already clear that Taiwan can be a subject of uh, Japanese uh, exercise of the right of collective defense. So I think that's, and I think we have made message very clear to the Chinese. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Takanaka. And also thank you, Richard, for answering all the questions. I think we don't have time for an, any more questions. So um, may I call on? Moritz Klein Brockhoff, the Regional Director of the Southeast and East Asia Office of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom in Thailand to close the webinar, which has been really very interesting. Now there's more appetite to know, to learn more about Kishida the man and then the, watch him in the next years. So please Moritz uh, for the closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Marites. Well, it's my, my pleasure to give a very brief um, closing remarks today. I uh, want to thank everybody who was involved in um, putting this event together, everybody who uh, presented and the responders, and it was also a lively discussion. Uh, I'm very happy that we had the event, um, partly because um, there are not so many about Japan. Um, Japan obviously is um, a very, very important country globally, uh, politically, economically, and as this discussion also showed geopolitically. And um, if, I, if I look at the, the international media, I don't find enough on uh, Japan. So just, just focusing on, on an election, uh, despite the fact that we all think we know the outcome, uh, but we did focus on it, um, um, was, was a good idea. And, and um, I certainly learned a lot. Um, without taking sides in the election and without uh, being sympathetic to a conservative party, uh, allow me to remark that as a liberal, I find it refreshing that somebody can uh, campaign in a country on capitalism. That is rare these days. Um, it's, it's gotten a bad reputation. And it is, in my view, the only concept that um, could bring about the sort of prosperity that allows for uh, any sort of um, social measures. So uh, I'm a fan of capitalism and there are not many countries where you can campaign on it. And that's something I learned today, new Japanese cap capitalism, uh, which, um, which I liked hearing again, without um, taking any sides. So with that, again, thank, every, th thank you everybody for, um, for joining us. Also all, uh, those who followed us here on Facebook and elsewhere and have a great day. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks Thank for all being here. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Takanaka, thank you. Thank you very much. Start our future watch.